This video is the social reproduction at the 2014 Dublin Anarchist Book Fair. The speakers are Selma James and Connor McCabe. Uh, hello. Uh, welcome to the, to the Anarchist uh, Dublin Book Fair this year. Uh, we are very, very happy to announce Selma James, who I don't think she really needs an introduction. She is uh, the foundation of the campaigning for wages for, for housework. She's an uh, anti-racist, anti-sexist organizer anti for anti-capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think she needs more introduction. And um, so she's going to talk about her and reproductive rights and Colin McCabe, which is a um, lecturer in UCD in social justice and uh, the author of Sins of the Father, is going to give the Irish um, uh, concept, the ideas uh, of uh, concept of the political economy, yeah, the context, the context of the political economy. So we talk for, Sena will talk for 30 minutes, then uh, Connor will talk, and then we'll let the floor to ask questions and answers. So thank you very much. And uh, just to remind that we have contacts and feedback forms. If people can, the contact forms are optional, but if people can fill the feedbacks, it would be cool to see what we need to improve. And that we need that book fair cost us around 5,000 euros. So if people could leave some donations on the pockets at the door, it would be deadly. Um, <laughs> and, and also, that, of course, the most important is going to be a party after we have very good DJs until very late. So I hope I'll see you there. Thank you. So. OK, I'm not used to sitting so low. So do you mind if I find a top seat on the table? You can sit, you can just speak about it. I don't want to be here. <laughs> can I be here? Yeah, of course. OK. I, I'd like to do it this way if you don't mind. I, I have no practice as a university lecturer because I never went to university. Okay, thank you very much for having me. That's the first thing. I think it's really important. I feel, and the whole global women's strike of which I'm part feels, and Maggie, your name from Galway and the global strike feels that we are far too separate from each other considering how close we are and how close the histories of these two islands are. We are far too separate. And I don't mean I want to be cozying up to the Irish government. <laughs> I mean that the people of Ireland have contributed greatly to the class struggle in general, but particularly in the UK. And that has to be acknowledged, and we have to learn a lot more from you. And we have to let you know what we are doing against British imperialism. You don't know, because you're not there and they don't advertise. Okay? So, the first thing is that my being here, I feel this time, <coughs> confirms what last time began, which is that we belong together and that I intend not to keep away whether you like it or not. <laughs> and I hope you like it. The second thing is that I'm glad to be at a book fair because finally the Global Women's Strike has a book. Now we published before, but now there is a book, which I'm asking Maggie to give me a copy of. It should be somewhere here. Yes. Thank you very much, Maggie. Which has a lot of our history in it, because I think we have an interesting history, and I'm going to say what, a little bit about what that history is. OK, so now I truly begin. The first part is that I was part of the women's movement, the new women's movement that burst out in the late 1960s, early 1970s. I had been in the working class movement, the anti-imperialist movement, the anti-racist movement, and therefore the anti-capitalist movement for a lot of years. I was kind of born into it. You know, you're born into 
a movement family, and your father is fighting for the unions, and your mother is fighting at rent strikes, or trying to move people back into their homes who have been put on the street because they couldn't pay their bills in the 30s. And you don't join a movement, you're in it, and you're educated and shaped by it, and after a while, you understand the world and you say, I'm glad to have had that education because it's invaluable, because it told me how the world really is and they can't fool me. They can never fool me, because I knew from my first breath how the world really is from down below. But when the women's movement began, I was thrilled because I had always been concerned about the position, not my position as a woman, but our position as women. The fact that we were always, well, I was in a political organization, we always did the typing and the men did the writing. They wrote, they dictated, or they wrote by hand and we typed it up, that was our job. And then we babysat while they went to get me to have meetings, to make speeches and be profound about the exploited, not us, somebody else. And I knew that very well, and I had fought in my own organization and had a lot of help because the man who led the organization was a man called C.L.R. James, who was very unusual in a lot of ways. And one of them was, he asked me, would I write a pamphlet on women and that the intellectuals in the organization were not to speak to me, were not to tell me what to say, were not to interfere in any way that I was to do it. I was 21. I was a working class mother, I had been waitressing working in factories, my husband worked in factories, and I wrote about my neighbors and myself and discussed it with them and all kinds of things and wrote this pamphlet which opens this book. So you have the evidence. And so I was really concerned about women, but concerned about women from the bottom up. And then the women began to discover all kinds of things that I had never thought about lesbianism. I didn't know anything about lesbianism. Um, you know, prostitution. I didn't know anything about prostitution, although I suspected one or two women whom I had worked with on the assembly line, they were doing other things on the weekend. And I was thrilled, and delighted, and educated, and my mind was broadened. But they didn't know they were all white. They didn't know anything about racism. And I'll tell you some stories about that at another point, not today. And they didn't know anything about class, because they said that women should go out to work. I said, what? You mean on the assembly line, and waitressing, and cleaning toilets? What kind of liberation is that? And they didn't understand what I was speaking about, and I thought they were insane. Uh, but I was trying to help them, to educate them. I saw they were middle class, I said, listen, all the jobs are not good. They're not, you know, being a manager or being a lecturer at a university. They were, that's not what most women do. What most women do is care. And I, I told them one story. I had gone into my neighbor's house, because you do have to do something with your kid. He was about a year, and a year and a half old. And she had taken all her children's clothes and put them on a washing line across her front room. I thought she'd gone out of her mind. And I asked, why are you doing this? And she said, look, I'm selling them. She said, if I don't get any money of my own, I'm going to go crazy. So I'm selling most of the children's clothes. And it was such a revelation to me. I thought I was political, and I didn't even understand what the working class girl was talking about until she said that. And I understood that there's a whole world out there that the left has never understood and doesn't even know exists. And it's in their own kitchen. So when the movement began, I tried to tell people some of these things, but they weren't too keen, or most of them were not. And they came to the conclusion, I think, 
that they had to put women in high posts. That's what they had to do. Because when they got to with a high post, they were then going to fight for us from a position of power. I don't believe that. I didn't believe it then. But I didn't argue greatly against it. Because we had all agreed we wanted to change the world. Only thing is, changing the world meant different things for different classes. That was a lesson that we all have to learn, and the sooner we learn it, the better. I then began, I be, had begun just before this happened, to study Marx's capital. I had about six or seven friends, women and men, who sat down every Thursday night about eight o'clock and read for an hour and a half and discussed. And we didn't know what we were doing. And half the time, on the train back, I would read what we had just discussed and then call them when I arrived and say, listen, I was completely wrong. What he really means is this and this and this. It happened week after week. Wait to learn capital too. And I found in Capital that Marx says that the central commodity of capitalist production and reproduction and development and surplus value making and profit making and everything was labor power. That our labor became a commodity which we could sell. We could actually sell pieces of our time. Marx calls it prostitution, of course. Very early on, he identified that as prostitution. All work under capitalism, where they buy you, you are selling something. What part of your body you sell is irrelevant. It's all prostitution. That's for Marx. And I say, wait a minute. All my, all my comrades had betrayed me. They all knew that women made the basic capitalist commodity and they didn't tell me. Well, they didn't tell me because they didn't know. They never thought that women had anything to do with this. This labor power grew when they didn't. Women knocked themselves out to make it and loved them and cared for them and worried about them and made sure they went to school and try to get them so that they would be a little bit better than the working class family that had born them. And we had a right to capitalist wealth because we made the basic capitalist commodity, the working class. And so I said, we should get money for this. But I not only said that, I said, we need financial independence. The woman told me who put her clothes on the line. She said, look, I, I want this money or I'll go mad. We also needed to have that work recognized because the fact that we're making, reproducing the whole working class is, you know, a joke. It's serious. It's basic. It's survival for the whole human race. Uh, but that there was a power relation between women and men which was based on precisely the fact that women had no money for their work, men got money for their work, and therefore men had the power in the household. Now you might say that that's not true today, and I might say that you haven't understood anything. Because women have gone out to work, we get less than men do, and we're landed with the whole of the work of the home, whether or not we have ourselves been exploited for a lower pay that men would, that men would get for the same job. So that this power relation, which is established between women and men, is a basic power relation within the working class. Well, once I had cracked that nut and formed an organization which began to do political work so that you understand something, because without a political work you understand nothing. You think you do, but theory is nothing if it's not political work that informs it. I'll tell you that another time. 
you know, unless when we started to do political work, then we understood a lot. We understood that this was not the only power relation within the working class, that there was race. And that was an easy one for me because I had been in the anti-racist in the black movement. And uh, I was in the anti imperial I had been in the anti-imperialist movement, and I knew that if you're in the third world, they think this of you, but if you're in the industrial world, they think better of you. And in fact, I noticed, because it was very prominent and obvious, that those people who said there was only one point of production, and that's the capitalist point of production, had not understood how big the working class was. In fact, they had, um, a, a, what you call it when it's very small, a mini. They had a mini conception of the working class. They were white, they were male, they were in industrial countries, and they were probably all in London, really. <laughs> Well, it wasn't like that at all. Third world people didn't become workers when they came to, Euro to Europe. Third world has been working for the British Empire and some other empires as well, not as any half as big as the British. And being exploited and being under the crack, under the whip of the capitalist counter-revolution, which they call development. And so there were the women, and so there were and men, and there were people of color and white people. And then and there were third world and industrial people. And then there were older people and younger people. And Marx has something that I just grabbed onto when I was trying to work this out. He speaks about a hierarchy of labor powers. He's speaking about hierarchy of workers, but he's saying they're not workers in this context. They're merely that commodity. It happens that they're human, but that's irrelevant to capital. They try to treat us like machines anyway. A hierarchy of labor powers and the scale of wages to correspond. And I said, that's my boy. He has put into words what I have found out, or at least at what I was finding out, and I wrote a pamphlet called Sex, Race, and Class. And it was on the basis, this quote was the center. And then I spoke about many things. But what I was really trying to describe was that the working class is not homogeneous, but it is a collection of power relations where we are divided. Uh, uh, and that capital only is able to rule because we cannot get together to be units unified. And we cannot be unified because structurally, <coughs> not bad attitudes, forget those, structurally we are divided. Financially we are divided. In the organization of production internationally we are divided. And I felt that what was clear as day was that you had to have the autonomy of the organizations that had been developed in the 60s. You had to have those autonomous organizations attacking the power relations among us, but without separatism. That is, we didn't get autonomous. We as women were not autonomous only to be pardon me, only to be undermining the power relation with men. We were undermining the power relations with men, first of all, because we were affected by it, but second of all, that was the only way to be anti-capitalist, because they were standing in our way, because they were preventing the development of our movement, because they said, do the dishes, so that we weren't doing the movement. I'm being a bit you know, um, comical about that, you know, a bit flippant about that, because I don't have a lot of time, but fundamentally what I'm saying is we, I am describing what is the actual relationship. I'm not talking about men's sexism. I am a Marxist, and therefore I believe that our attitudes are based on the social relationships which we actually have 
I can't say enjoy because I don't enjoy them. <laughs> but uh, based on these relationships, our attitudes reflect the power relations among us that we as working class people, we as those who are the heroes of wood and drawers of water in the world, we have to overcome in order to unify. That's where I got now what happened to the women's movement. I'll go back to this, but where's the women's movement? The women's movement was busy climbing up. They, they were feminists, and I hear the word feminist so many times a day, I wonder what it means, because it means so many different things to so many different people. You better find out what you mean, each of you, when you say feminist. I never call myself a feminist. You know, one of the feminists in the women's movement said that Margaret Thatcher was a feminist. That finished it. <laughs> <laughs> could never call myself a feminist again. <laughs> but you know, feminism is largely, I don't know about Ireland, but in the UK, it is associated with the women who made it. Now there's a woman called Alison Wolfe. I never find the papers when I want them, but I'm going to make an effort. Um, oh, it's not in this. Yeah. A woman called Alison Wolf, who wrote a book called The XX Factor. <coughs> no, look, I can't find it, but I will find it for you later. Yes, here it is. And she says, I don't know if this is the one that has the, what she says, I can show you the stuff. She says, of the women in the UK, this is a UK survey, she's an academic, very nice, not very anti-capitalist. <laughs> she said about 13% of the female population has moved up. They're in the professions, they're in management. She said about 87% have not. She said the difference between them, she said there's always been class differences among women. This is not new. The queen and I were never sisters. She said, but this is different. She said they don't have the problems that women have, that women traditionally have, or that the 87% have. She said they don't have problems with pay equity on the whole, because the boardroom is equal. You know, largely, of course, they fight among themselves, but in the boardroom, you get your share of the meat pretty equally. She said about 40% of them, and the figure is going up, don't have children. But the 60% who do have children, they can afford nannies. Often there are immigrant women who are ready to work for less. And they don't, and they themselves, on the whole, are not carers. And that is really a crucial word. Because when I was speaking about the reproduction of the of labor power, I was talking about carers. From capital's point of view, we make the fodder for industry, etc. But from the working class point of view, then we make human beings. And not only do we make human beings until they're old enough to work and go to school and do the rest and have their own families, but we do justice work. When they're stopped by the police, it's the mother who goes and says, let my boy go, my boy did nothing, you stopped him, you're a racist, you know, let him go. Or when he goes to prison, or when she's picked up for prostitution, but when she has to go to work, I take care of the children. In other words, the caring is in fact 
the protection of the working class. And although we've been the men as big and strapping and often working hard to pr protect us, I don't deny that for a moment, from day to day, <coughs> invisibly, it is the women who protect us. It is. I have a friend who's a lawyer in Jamaica, a civil liberties lawyer. And when I saw him and I said, you know, I'm doing counting women's work and this, he said, you know, I've read all of that. I've read everything you do. I want to tell you something. He said, when a man is arrested and put in prison in Jamaica, or when he is shot by police in Jamaica, who comes to my office is the mother, the sister, the auntie, the cousin, all women, and they say, say about boy. That's not an anecdote. That is a whole historical perspective. That means that is what the women of the world are doing, which the left have never even noticed, let alone supported. And that's my case against the left, you know. I'm not, a, I'm not in the left. I'm of the left. I'm certainly not of the right. <laughs> but I'm not in the left. And I could not be in the left because the real work of humanity, at least the spearhead of it, is done by women, but neglected by the left, and sometimes neglected by women of the left as well. So on the one hand, this is the work that women are doing, and on the other hand, of the 87%, I don't mean every mother is a chick, is marvelous, not me, I couldn't say that, but the 13% are not doing this work, but are making this work. They are, that what has happened to the ruling elite, the 1%, by the way, it's much less than 1%. Let's leave it 1% for a moment. What they're doing is integrating their rule. They're not sexist. They're not racist. They often like people with disabilities, lesbian and gay is just their speed. They have integrated what they have denied us from and prevented us from integrating. They have it themselves, so that when they come to speak against us, the sectors that we belong to are represented in their aid and deny our rights. That's the world in which we live right now. Now, I want to say just a couple of other things, because I think my time would probably be running out. Yes, where am I? Well, I'm five more minutes. That's enough in that way. Um, I believe in the autonomy that I was describing, and I believe that autonomy, the autonomy of different sectors who work, and this is very important, who work for their own liberation, beginning with themselves but understanding that their struggle must be shaped in such a way that it does not scab on other sectors and that it undermines the power of sectors who are above us, but not in a way that makes them weaker against capital. I'll tell you what I mean. The third world the women are doing the same work. The same division of labor that we know is there, except the technology is not there, so that this society allows women to spend 20, 25 hours of their lives every week going for water when there is no need they could have a pipe. You know, it would be much cheaper than a drone. One drone would probably pay for the whole of piped water in the world. It's like that. But the power relation, but what they have to do, if you're in a third world country, what you have to do, your autonomy, and this has been shown by what they do, your autonomy must attack the power of men over you. 
but not in a way that allows the state to imprison them or punish them. You'll do that yourself, thank you very much. You know well how to punish men. You know, the, the Indian women in our network, when the men rape, they surround the house and make it clear if he comes out and ever touches that woman again, they're going to beat him up, not one, 50 of them. Well, you know, they can't be 50. So they stop. I'm not saying that's the only way to do it. I'm just giving that as one example of how you attack the men but you attack them in such a way that they are not vulnerable to their exploitants. They're strengthened, because now when he meets his exploiter, the women will be behind him, rather than standing inside where you meet him, because he never did anything good for me. So that's how we work as a network we are various sectors of women, older and younger. The single mothers have their own organization. The English Collective of Prostitutes and the U.S. Prostitutes Collective, their sister organization in the U.S., have their own organization and network. Queer Strike is the, is the organization of queer people, women and men, because we also work with a men's organization called Payday, whose slogan is refusing to kill is not a crime and has built a network of refusers from Israel to Turkey to some countries in Africa to the UK and I think Ireland is involved who <coughs> refuse to have anything to do with, uh, with armed, being armed by the state for war or other purposes. That's how we organize and that's how we fight among ourselves. Because it's not as though once you decide you're going to work together that everything works grand. It does not. What happens, however, is that there is mutual respect among you because you've been working together for some time. And because the men have seen that the leadership that the women provide, which is anti-sexist as well as anti-racist, etc., is useful and powerful and enables them to build their network with, uh, with more confidence and with more internal direction. So we work with them and we deal with the crises as they come up. But the very fact, and sometimes I feel that we get on so well that the autonomy looks like it's not necessary, but let me tell you, it always is. And the very fact that women of color in the global women's strike have their own network, is a tr the very fact of its existence is, um, ensures a certain kind of good working together, ensures that people are not sloppy about their racism or their anti-racism, pardon me, are always paying attention to the other sectors, and that's what we want. What we want, I never used this word before in this context, but I'll use it now. What we want is a culture of concern and consideration. And finally, I want to say, I said earlier on, and I want to say it again. We began by saying that women make labor power. Good, that was a very good beginning, but it was only a beginning. Women reproduce the entire human race, and the left has not noticed. And you should really think about that, I don't think this minute, but sometime later on. And you have to always really take into account that this reproduction is not only physical and biological, but social, that caring work is really relationships, that women are the fundamental makers of relationship. And Maggie, who's an anthropologist, will tell you, an archaeologist will tell you that relationships 
our society, and that's true. Women make society. But what has happened in recent years, as the 13% have gone up, is that the biological nature of our contribution as women is demeaned. And it bugged me for a long time about why that was. And then I saw that the whole world, the, ecolo the ecological devastation that the world has suffered, is also dismissed. And I began to understand that they think they're God, even if they're atheists. They think that the machine is superior to the natural process. And that is the end of the world. Because we are part of nature. Whatever else we are, and I hope we're many things, we are part of nature. And the ecology is what we lean on and depend on. It's our source. It's our mother's milk. And they demean women and they demean the environment. And we have to wake up to the fact that, you know, that the struggle of women is also the struggle of the natural world. Not because we can't think, but because we can think. And we have understood that our biology and our environment are crucial to survival, and we want to survive. Thank you. Uh, so Connor is going to give fifth, uh, a bit uh, of the Irish context, 10, yeah, 10, 15 minutes, and then it will be questions and answers for the floor. So. Did I make it for 30 minutes? In 30 minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, and thanks to Sana for the talk. Um, I'm going to try and just give some kind of brief kind of, uh, context um, for what kind of Sana was kind of uh, talking about. For an Irish context, so it's really kind of care and social kind of production in Ireland, and it's some kind of observations. Um, about 15 minutes, it was a short video of Jim Powell, just to, to, to kind of cheers all over. Um, because, I mean, hey, what the hell? No, just why not? Speak to the mic, I can't hear you. Oh, yeah. That's a lot of um, Some definitions uh, of kind of social production. And this one's from the London based group, uh, a feminist kind of fight back, um, I like. And this article, I, I think, is worth checking out. And it says that social reproduction, it's, it's all the means by which a society then reduces its family, citizens, and workers. And again, just tying into what Ms. Salman was saying, and that it is necessary for a society to reproduce itself, the biological reproduction of people and workers. And all the social practices that sustain the population, bearing children, raising children, performing emotional work, um, food and clothing, uh, cooking and 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 and, uh, and uh, Now, and not only has this become sidelined in in kind of uh, kind of leftist thinking, uh, so to speak, it, 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 it most certainly has been kind of left out of the picture of, of the whole picture in terms of kind of mainstream uh, economic thinking as well. And uh, where kind of economic thinking in Ireland is, is pretty much here. This is, this is pretty much what it draws upon. And it's a rational economic man. Um, even in, like, in, in other countries, you may get some other kind of conceptual frameworks at, at play. In Ireland, it is neoclassical all the way. Um, and what kind of classical uh, macroeconomics kind of holds as its kind of view of, of the world? So we so have kind of this view here of kind of social production um, and what Sam you know, was saying. What macroeconomics uh, says is that, that we have these rational economic man is the core of all economic act, um, activity. It's an autonomous agent, able-bodied, independent, rational, heterosexual, who's able to choose from a number of options that are limited only by certain constraints. 
and, the, and um, he weighs costs and benefits to maximise utility, and he is self-interested in the marketplace, but a cent in the, in the home as well. Um, there he is now. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't he great? Um, now, this will come back to Tick on Jim Power because I, you know, in, in the clip I'll show from Vincent Brown, we'll see that this is not just ideas on a, on, on, you know, on a page. This is actually how it plays out in terms of Ireland even today. Um, going into care and gender and, and, and caring, um, I'll draw upon a work of, of, my, of, of my colleagues here. Um, from 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 Kathleen Lynch and, and from Maureen Lyons, talking about gender and caring in large scale context. So, if you have facts and figures on on that information, there. Now, we start off by saying again, just tying in again to, to, to kind of Sam's work, that there are deep gender inequalities in the doing of care and love work that operate to the advantage of men. It, it is women's unwaged labour and related domestic labour that frees men up to exercise control in the public sphere of politics, <coughs> the economy and culture. And there is a moral imperative on women to do care work that does not apply equally to men. Um, as parents get older, it's, it's kind of understood who be looking after those parents. It's not to the sons who the parents would be keeping an eye on, it's seen as, as the daughters, if they have any. Um, it, it's a highly gendered moral code that impels women to do the greater part of the primary care, with most believing they have no choice in the matter. So, it's, so, it, it, so we try to really kind of draw that out, a, a kind of skeletal kind of framework of, of, of what that actually means in an Irish kind of context. Well, even in terms of how things are measured, it's a cause. You know, I mean, this is. You know, there are um, ideologies at play, even in terms of how things are, are measured. In terms of the census and the quarterly household survey, that are the two main sources of stats on care work in, in Ireland. Um, in the census, care is defined as being given by a person aged 15 years and over, who, who then provide regular unpaid help for a friend or family member with a long-term illness, health problem or a disability. Does that kind of strike you as missing from that definition? I'll just ask a question there. Children. children. Where are the children in my definition? It is, it is incredible. This is a government kind of stat viewpoint of how the world works. So when the Irish government, oh sorry, the Irish state says this is how our world works. There's no care work for children. That's not part of how this world works rational economic man. Um, in, in the way care is defined in the census, and this is from uh, the article, it excludes what then constitutes a major a category of care work, that of the ordinary, everyday care of children, unless that child has recognised a disability. Data on the care of children it, it's implied, is, it, is, is uh, compiled in the quarterly in the National Health Service Survey, but the focus is on the areas of work involved in caring, so we, so we don't know the nature and scope of the caring involved. Now, capitalism only measures what it can profit from. That's its viewpoint of the, of the world. That's its moral sense of the world, if you want. Um, so, going back to this again, that according to the 2006 census, in this article is, is from 2008, there are less than 150,000 people, 5% of the population in unpaid care of work, of whom 61% are women and, and about 20% uh, are men. However, in good measure all types of caring activity, we see that there are 1 million people who do caring who are not named in the census. They are not paid either. Now, a back of the envelope a, the calculations that even if we gave the, the minimum wage to those women and people doing that care work, it's 8.8 8, 8 euros is expected cent an hour, every hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It would cost capitalism 65 billion a year just in Ireland alone. It gets all that 
work for free and it's still not. <laughs> it still gives out and it still says we, you know, we cannot make money. How societies reproduce themselves is not because of capitalism, it's in spite of capitalism. <laughs> you know? And this is the lie that it says. It does not measure what it does not see as being unprofitable. We don't have to play by those rules. Um, even though this is my concept, even though it is no doubt unintentional, I disagree, I, I think it is. <laughs> but it means then that there are no errors counted in terms of work errors. However, even, though, even when it is measured, women are, are almost five times as likely to work long care hours than is the case for men. And women spend a much more time at care work than men, even when they are employed. Mm. And this is from Nora Lawrence's kind of census from uh, 2011. This is their kind of mapping of what they see as being economically inactive. Hmm. And, the, and, the, and the, a category here is looking after home or family aged 16 to 74 years of age. Economically inactive. So again, there's a, there's a conceptual framework at, at, at a play here. Now, even at that, they say that in parts of kind of northwest kind of Ulster, there are around 10% of women are what they say is being economically inactive. In, in other words, they're looking after home or family. Now, are they telling us that 90% of women in those parts of Ulster do not do any household work at all? I mean, this is part of the lies that come forward. What is not measured? This is seen as being normal. This is pathological. It, it, this is a pathological view of how societies work. And it's in our every sense as well, in, in the Norman census here as well. Now, again, just drawing from the Northern Ireland because it, it's a, you know, just to give um, a, a different stand on it. This is from a, a report on economic inactivity that's measured in the Northern Ireland. And, and, and he said that in April to June of 2012, there were 196,000 women aged 16 to 64 who were economically inactive in Northern Ireland with a resultant inactivity rate of 33.5% or 28.9% EGB. When doing stats in economics always give an incomplete odd number. It, it makes it sound much more <laughs> but realistic. Never say 23%, always say 23.5%. Because then in your head it sounds like, well, they must actually work that out. Um, you may laugh, but watch RTE tonight. Uh, you know, it won't be talking about figures. They'll give these type of odd numbers, and that's what's being played out here. Now, look at how they measure what is being economically inactive. And I walk over here, kind of TED Talk style, and I walk over here. <laughs> um, there's no mice with the Anderson's book first. <laughs> but, um, Sick and disabled is being economically inactive. Family and at home, student and then retired. Males, blue, females is red. Family and home, it's almost all seen as being female in in in, in, in a darn army. And being economically inactive. Now this is ridiculous. But these are the figures that are being kind of put forward. There's a viewpoint, a view of the world that is being kind of put forward. In terms of health, and again, even though it, it, it has gone from the Northern Ireland it, it report, um, it applies down south here as well, of course. This is from the World Health Organization talking about how they need to, to move in and um, um, essentially privatize healthcare. There's a problem here because how do you make, they need to make the health system in the north more streamlined and economically efficient. Now, we already know what they see as being economically inefficient, but that's sick and can disable people. So you have this thing that if you want an economically efficient healthcare system, you've got to get rid of sick people from it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, you may laugh, but um, I have yet to see any private hospital that will take seriously sick people. I, if you want to get health insurance, and you're sick, they will turn you down. Because you're sick. Because where's the profit in being sick? There's caring and love work. Where's the profit? There's no profit in caring for sick people. 
so he don't. Now finally, um, I'll draw it into a word of analysis, and it has to do with the kind of shift in property activity in capitalism itself in the last kind of 30 years, and this is kind of canary wharf, um, uh, it just not above the kind of cloud line. There has been a shift in like, property seeking activity. And, and, and as finance, finance is moving in to privatise those parts of the state apparatus that have been won over the years in terms of kind of care of um, And they are being privatised now, not for the business itself, but in order to monetize those income streams. It, it, it's a bit of a change from, from a usual view of, 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 of what kind of, 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 of what capitalism actually does. It wants its hands on the income streams, not per se on the business themselves. Um, so again, going back to you know, famous fight back, they say that over the past kind of 30 years, that despite their being essential to human life, a neoliberal a, a restructuring across the world has privatized um, it um, eroded and demolished our shared, our shared resources and also did a crisis of social reproduction. Um, of course, going back to this world, we've heard from Salmon and from uh, some of the states like today that what is essential to human uh, society is care and social reproduction. That's not what John Moran of, of, of John's line in the South is. He makes it very clear. He says that property is pivotal as a conduit for, for, for financial and economic life. Now again, there's a clash kind of going on here. I don't think we're really, I think we're aware of it, but I don't think we're really you know, seeing the, the real kind of at a play here in terms of how these people see how our, how our world works. Um, I'm, I'm going to show Jim Carroll now. God bless him. Um, some people might know him uh, in, in, in the audience, so I'll just get the, uh, the, the file here. This is from the Bits of Brown show from about three years ago, and there's and, and two people talking on it. If, if first of all, is the Jim Power, who's an economist, um, and, and, and it's talking about uh, single parents. And you have on the panel as well, uh, Edith Louise uh, Bayless of Spark. So we'll show what Jim Carroll has to say. And again, have that view of rational economic man, that view of that conceptual framework of how the world works, as we hear kind of uh, Jim talk. Is, is, is it sound okay for this? Yeah? Yeah. Um, you know, people make choices to be single parents. So they should be aware of the consequences that there, there is a certain welfare situation. And you make a choice. Just as we all make our choices. Do children choose to be uh, ch children of single parents? <laughs> no, but the single parents choose to be parents. Even a land. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm not saying that's wrong. People are entitled to make those choices. But uh, uh, if you make the choice, you have to be prepared to accept the consequences of that. Just, just, just as, you know, if I were to buy a single parent. Did you hear that last night? Yeah, he just compared a, a human life to buying a a, a second property. A second property. He says that having <laughs> this is pathological. Absolutely. This is completely pathological. I am convinced. Hopefully, my whole being on a human. Uh, in, in the humanity is that we will look back on this as, as a species in 200 years ago and go, what the hell were they thinking? But this is what's at play here. So we had from John Moran talking about how we eat property, not you know, human societies, how they get at least, this has been kind to them, 65, 60 billion euros of, of free work and they still can't make uh, money from that. Now, I'll play for Louise because she's not really having any of this, and uh, it's definitely worth complaining. Now, she has to kind of think on her feet here, but even with that, um, it's well done. Thanks to the question on 
So you're saying that the social welfare bill needs to be cut, but how do you think this measure is actually going to cut the social welfare bill? If people who have part-time jobs and are on reduced one parent family are going to be forced into full-time jobs that don't exist and be forced to give up the part-time job, how is that going to how is that going to cut the social welfare bill? It's going to increase it. Well, the, the part-time job would be freed up for somebody that's... So, the so, so, then, so, so, then, so, so, so somebody else would get the job, so the so so social welfare spend reduced. on that side will be reduced. Sorry, I, I, what I'm, no, no, what no, I'm no, saying no, is... No, can I just say to you, yeah. I want to say a few things. There aren't 90,000 full-time jobs available in three years' time for us all to go on to. We have our part-time jobs and we want to hold on to them. We want to be able to support our family. We want to be able to earn and to learn. Well, we want the same that's the choice we made. That's the choice we've made. Thirty-five percent of us are lone parents because we were in relationships, marriages that broke up. Our country does not impose statutory maintenance system like it does in any of every other country that brought in this personal that's state, that's yes, it is. It is. So th there were other things that could have been done. There is actually legislation in place that the maintenance recovery unit could collect money from and, and reduce the social welfare bill that way, so that the people who were at the absconding from the children would be left to hold the bill. But that's not being used. What's being done is attacking the single parents who are being responsible for the children. Yes, it should. And that should be yeah, and that should have been done instead of just attacking. And the reason I believe that we were attacked was because low parents haven't got a voice. We haven't got a media presence. We're not and we're never together as a group before because it was very hard because we've got the child obligations. But all he had in that was choice. That's all he had. From the, you know, gets with Vincent Brown, and then, you know, you put, you know, there at the end. It's a choice you make. It's a choice, it's a choice. This mantra of kind of rational choice theory, rational economic man at play, happening all the way through, whatever. This is not just academia. This is like national state policy, you know, uh, playing out here. There is an ideology, there is an ideological battle here as well. And I think that the work of Selma helps us fight that battle, we should definitely embrace it. Um, just going back to the last point, just to end up then. Um, yeah, just finally that um, when talking about finance, care, the complexization of care, we need to look at some of the players in all of this. And in a large kind of context, that means law firms. It means accounting firms. It means going to stop public affairs. These are, part of the, these, these are part of the structures that are trying to erode whatever gains we have made, limited as they are, those gains we have made in, in the last 40 50 years. They're under a, you know, attack at the moment. And where they're coming from, we should be quite, I think, clear about. So we have my Ar uh, Arthur Cox here, that's down on kind of Harker Street. And Arthur Cox walks between the raindrops in this country. Um, you look up their contracts and their website, and you'll see how many fingers they have in the pies of this country. Uh, this is Dylan Hustis that's involved in, in privatizing social housing as we speak and calling it innovation. Again, whatever gains we have made. But, these, but this is what we have to try and bring onto the into our kind of focus then as well. Um, and then finally, from, from the Swan Ireland, um, you know, that cuts the services, it, it cuts its wages, it's all connected. In the words of the wire, all the pieces matter, you know? And this is true here as well. So yeah, I'll just come back over then to Sarah for some questions. Thank you. Um, okay, thank you very much. Um, Selma and Connor. I'm gonna take some questions from the floor now. Uh, just before to remind that I have seven in flowing tide, the pop. Uh, Selma is gonna give another talk about organizing on sex workers. And um, that's the same pop where the party is going to be after. So that's perfect. And uh, so anybody has any questions? Hmm. Okay. Maybe you, do you mind to come a bit closer because maybe Selma can hear you, <coughs> if you don't mind, or speak loud. Yeah, can I, can I say to you, is it Selma? Yeah. Selma is like, your okay. really no. Do you mind to come a bit closer, please, if it's okay? 
Maggie, maybe, maybe you should come up. Oh. Yeah, I know, but she knows the video. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I thought your, your talk was really, um, it was really interesting, it was really amazing. Like you gave uh, lots of stuff which wasn't clear for me uh, you were talking about. Um, and I guess like one of the things you were saying was um, how um, like the left and society in general hasn't, uh, it hasn't um, taken notice of women's work or other groups' work. Um, and I'm wondering like as this becomes uh, more clear, like, the, like what you're doing in terms of telling people, like making people notice and stuff like that. Yeah, um, what to do about that. Yeah, as that happens, like what kind of a change will that make? Because, yeah. because you were mentioning like, um, you know, sort of the ruling class and stuff, they're very, um, you know, they're, they're very slick, like, and as what Connor was saying, like, just at the end, like, you know, they're, they're very integrated. Quite, uh, they're, they're integrated, and as Connor was saying, like, it's, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're very um, together, like, so I'm wondering, like, how do those two things balance up? Like, basically, I'm just asking, like, uh, now is, in terms of, like, more, in terms of, like, your lifetime, is, is this a good time or a bad time, or, or like, how, like, are you hopeful for the future? What? No, when you speak loud, don't whisper. They might hear you. That helps. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of during your lifetime, is this a good time or a bad time? For that kind of no, no, that kind of change. Oh, what can she change? Finish. What can oh, okay. That's a very good question, and I'm glad I, you know, heard it properly. Is this the mic? Will you hear me here? Maybe I, I, I don't know why this one now. Yeah. Address it, 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 it up here then, uh, maybe. You want to come to the front? Then this is fine. There is not a better time. That's the first thing. Because we need each other at this moment in time as we have never needed each other before. And for the left to stop being repressive and to re stop reinforcing men's power. You know, a number of women today said various things. Just in passing, it wasn't even the discussion, you know, the primary discussion about how they are really repressed as members of the left. I think it's tremendously, it's a really good moment for the left to reevaluate itself in another way. And for that, they need to, the left needs the women of the left to speak up and to speak up not merely for the indignity, not merely against the indignities that you suffer, but in terms of how you are part of women. You see, the problem, one problem is, you know, there's so much to say, I'll try to be brief. One problem that women of the left face is what men of the left face, they think they're different because they're in the left. And you're not. <laughs> You know, I don't know who's doing the dishes at your house, but it's very likely to be a woman. And it's very likely that you help from time to time. But help means that you don't take primary responsibility. Or you live alone, and you don't care, or live with a couple of other folks, and you don't really care what the house looks like. But in general, you know, a BBC producer told me once that she goes, on, she goes on a site to do the filming, and the blokes will come to her and say, well, do you have an aspirin? I have a terrible headache. Or, I've got a cold and I've just run out of Kleenex. And she would always say, like, I am your producer, I am not your mother. <laughs> you know, you go around the world being a mother. That's why I said today, you know, from the age of five, that young, you know, girls are mothering. Um, I'm not so sure I agree absolutely. It's not merely that we, um, we instinctively do that. I think it has, a, or that's not what you said exactly, I know that. But the point is that we are pushed in a position when generations upon generations of women are dependent financially on men. That is what happens. And that is how capital uses the past because it was a point at which women were the sole carers of children because it was such a, an important biological job that women were doing. Breastfeeding is absolutely crucial to human survival. You wouldn't know that if you looked at the, all of the 
non-breastfeeding that goes on in Ireland, it is such a scandal, it is just absolutely outrageous. Healthcare begins with breastfeeding. All healthcare begins with breastfeeding, and you wouldn't know that in Ireland that produces milk and cheese or blah, 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 and gives their infants the first junk food formula. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that the women have to remember that when they ask the men to change and ask their organization to change, that they don't speak only on behalf of themselves, but they speak on behalf of all women that they themselves are part of. And begin to begin with the work that women have been doing. And if you've been able to get rid of some, don't forget that your mother hasn't. You don't speak for her. Tell her you're in an organization and you want to make her work count. You'll be surprised how surprised she will be. <laughs> You know, that's part of it. But the other part of it is to look at all the other power relations within the working class. That's an important one, women and men. But uh, what about women of color and men of color and women of color in relation to white men? You know, it, I'm sure that among the academics, they have done what is absolutely natural to be done, which is to find out what the wage hierarchy is. But it goes something like this. I haven't seen it. I've never heard about it. But I'll tell you what it's like to be. At the top is white men between 21 and 35. After that, it goes down a bit. And before that, it's definitely low, because young people are exploited unbearably. You have to address that. You might get some young members who are not in academia. Below that are white women more or less the same age, but not the childbearing age. They do, don't do well. Mothers have the lowest wages of white women of any particular sector. Mothers have the lowest wages, because we're doing something else, you know. And the employers are quick to understand that, they're, that you're not absolutely at their disposal 24 hours a day, and therefore you must have lower wages. And they can get it. They can get you first. <coughs> they know that. They have an instinct. That's why they make profit. Uh, below that will be immigrant men with the right to stay, and immigrant below that, immigrant women with the right to stay. And then you get down to the really low wages, which is undocumented workers, women and men, and you get somewhere down there also the young people, and also students between you know, August and October, whenever your terms end, you try to get a job, you get anything because you have that student loan. So you have a picture of the working class, and you have to drop your abstraction of point of production. Please drop it, it's so boring. <laughs> and it's so untrue because it speaks to some people but it leaves out the rest, and ultimately it's racist and sexist. And you really need a more comprehensive view of the forces against capitalism. And you need that, and others need that, and that, it seems to me, is how to proceed. And if you ever want to discuss this in detail, I'm just across the water. It takes 55 minutes to get here. <laughs> just find the fair, and I'll be here. Um, anybody has anybody has some question? Yeah. Uh, just uh, two things. Uh, just I was interested in thinking about the sisterhood. Uh, my mother uh, cleaned houses based on the rich people. It's a bit of a contradiction for people when you're when you're working class. Um, and one of our better employers, she always said our better oh, employer was a feminist. A very prominent feminist. So it occurred to me earlier that there is a contradiction that uh, feminism doesn't trump class. I mean, she was being exploited, however, she, however but she felt that the, the, the woman was a better employer. But this was a prominent feminist within the government. Uh, the other thing was uh, about health care, care in, in general. I think it's a very profound attack 
uh, like healthcare, caring professions are being taken away. And, being, and basically, what you have is uh, they're answerable to the um, investors. Uh, like for, uh, you know, I think at the ideological level, people don't understand, don't, don't see that address, I'm not saying they don't understand, address that uh, issue. The whole question of human empathy and, uh, you know, empathy, humanity is attacked when care is only for, you know, only if you can afford it. Um, it's a, you know, it's an undermining of human solidarity, but it's, 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 stopped at, it's stopped at a different technical level, you know, rather than, uh, I think it's a huge defeat for workers. And uh, the contradiction I wanted to ask Selma about, and I'm not informed, I'm not very well informed about the fate of housework, or the basis for housework, but uh, there's, the, there's, the, there's the prioritization of care, which will become all the more so if health is privatized, because sick children will have to be taken care of at home, for, you know, special needs children, and all falls back into the private sphere. Whereas you know, we would think the solution would be in, in socializing those, uh, uh, that, that, that whole aspect of you know, human care. It is a social issue. But, uh, you know, I think it's a, I just like our take, and I haven't really thought it through myself. I don't think there seems to be a contradiction between them. Good, thank you. Thank you for the question again, a very important one. Um, I, I'd like to deal with the question of uh, caring and um, paid caring and the austerity. And now I have to go back to the UK uh, experience, which is probably not very different from your own, but I don't know your own. When Thatcher and the others wanted to destroy the school system, what they did was to attack teachers and attack teachers' pay and working conditions. And what the unions did was to defend teachers' pay and teachers' working conditions and never defended children. Never. They never said, teachers are responsible for our children. You are attacking our children when you attack teachers. Never. They never. They never defended teachers as carers. And many teachers were broken hearted about this. But what happened ultimately as the teachers, uh, that is that teachers fell in line with the unions rather than the unions falling in line with the teachers. So that one of the mothers at our center in London went to school with one or two other mothers to say we do not want the police in the schools. And the teachers said, the teachers said, they keep order. Now, any teacher who needs the police to keep order should be thrown out of the school system. Because if you cannot keep order, that means you are boring the children out of their minds. And you are disrespectful, and you are not teaching nothing. But they did defend the police, and ultimately she and her mates lost the struggle, and there is a, a, a policeman in the school. This is Hampstead uh, High School, if you ever want to find out about that particular struggle, because what had happened was that a black kid was beaten up by the police, and there was a row because the police, the, the kids came out of the school and they said they were right. They just were going home and they said they were rioting and they got hold of a black kid and they beat him and we helped the family to defend the kid and they ultimately got compensation, but we also got the police in the school. Okay, uh, that is absolutely right 
that many in the caring professions now, more than before, nurses, a nurse told me that his, his uh, manager said, you went there to bandage the leg of that elderly man. You didn't go to have a conversation with him. Your business is to bandage the leg and go on to the next job. In other words, he was a third world man. He was a humane person, trained to be, by his mother, no doubt. He thought he'd have a conversation with the old man. No way. That takes too much time. So that all of the caring professions are under threat. And the teachers and the uh, nurses and other carers who are, these are the professional carers, have been driven down and some of them are absolutely fed up with it because they feel they have, their profession has been destroyed. And I am just organizing a whole um, thing for people to write in. Maggie knows about it because I've asked her to write. She's a teacher. To write in and say the conflict between your will not to be exploited and your will also to be accountable to the people you're supposed to be helping and how that feels and how it has worked out and what we can do about it. And I'm hoping to get 30 or 40. I hope also from Ireland, if anybody is interested, please give Maggie your email address because the thing is almost ready to go. And I'd like to gather that and publish it online, no problem, no money needed, so that we begin to chase that up. Now, you said that is, the, as for the carers, the low paid carers, we have a petition demanding, it's called invest in caring, not killing, a living wage for mothers and other carers. I hope you'll sign, I hope you'll adopt it. Maggie has been working out to have a petition here that's based on that one, but based on Irish facts and the Irish experience. And if you're interested, we have a draft. I seem to have lost it. But it exists. I just don't have the hard copy. Um, and I may have it in the hotel room. And she, she has it on computer anyway. And if anybody is interested in working with her on that, that would be a very good thing, by the way, brother, for the left to have a look at and see if the, the women in the left may want to support something like that and write their own statements about their own reason for supporting it, not because you want to help the poor downtrodden over there. Help the poor downtrodden right here. You know, admit that you are the poor downtrodden. <laughs> admit that to yourself, to each other, and then blast it at the men, I advise it. <laughs> um, you said something else that you asked about, about class and what trumps, don't get into that. Don't get into the competition of whether as a woman she should, but as a feminist she should not, but first of all, I don't know who feminist is. Second of all, it's very often that we behave in shocking ways to those who are less powerful than ourselves. And that's why I think those less powerful than ourselves should organize against us, okay? <laughs> to make it absolutely clear that they're not gonna take that mail. And that's what happens. Uh, you know, you're thinking of class as a table, ta you know, as a, you know, as a, yeah, as a table, you know, as an academic chart. It's not like that. You know, in the Wages for Housework campaign, there was a member who was the wife of Chrysler Europe. We got all the, what remained of their parties, and that was really nice. <laughs> I never had such good food. Life. <laughs> <laughs> and that was only what was left. But she was dedicated to the, to the Wages for Housework campaign. She said, I work for Christ just as much as he does, but I get nothing from them. She was an American woman, came from the grassroots. He moved up. And she said, I want money for myself. 
and I want it from Chrysler, because they owe it to me. Anyway, the point is she got on with the rest of us. She didn't agree with us on everything, but she agreed with us enough that she could be on our demonstrations and all the rest. Then there was another woman who is the wife, she's still alive and still in there, who is the wife of a retired engineer in the oil industry. What well, could be more corrupt? <laughs> but she's not corrupt. She wants wages for housework and she'll tell anybody at the drop of a hat that that's what she wants. And she has very good reasons for doing it and has had to ship all around the world because her husband had to go all around the world. She had to take her son all around the world and she doesn't want to be all around the world. She wants to be back home. And she says, I did this and this is my life and I worked for the oil company and I hate it. So, you know, what class is she? She's the housewife class. I know that's not a class. But I'm saying that we are many things and we have to acknowledge all the sectors that we are. This business, what is the name, the intersectionality. That is a big lie, that word. Because that hides all the complications, the human relationships, the power relations, and class. And intersectionality just puts a blanket on all of it and none of it is revealed. And what we're into doing is to revealing every, to revealing every single um, ec not, uh, uh, articulation of the conflict of sectors because in, over, in exposing them and understanding them and confronting them, that is the unity of the class. That's how the unity of the class is made. It's not made by somebody with a magic wand, I touch you, you're unified. No, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> you have to work it out all the time in the movement with goodwill. Somebody said that this one, with goodwill. You want to be together. But brother, you don't understand it. Please listen again, okay? You know, and I, I love you too. You know what I mean? <laughs> you have to work it out. That's how you work out an organization in a factory. You know, that is the working class way. I don't know how they do it up there. I think they do it, God, in a very brutal way. But we are trying not to be but we make our point because it is a class point. You see, the sectors are class, you know, class relations once removed. You know, and we have to deal with it that way. So is that a good beginning? I know the question asks for more. I have to leave it at that. Um, I, gonna, I can take, yeah, I can take a few more questions. Anybody? Just because you said it's, it's not intensely related, and uh, just because you just threw working class women under a bus to breastfeed in common, um, in Ireland, there's very little support for women from breastfeeding, and the majority of women that do breastfeed are middle class. It's very much a class issue, and I won't accept that comment. And I think if a woman wants to breastfeed, uh, there should be the support for there if she wants it. And if she doesn't want to breastfeed, that's perfectly her choice. And she's not giving jokes with that yeah. kid. And I think that's, that was a very glad day common to make. Yes, you know, I have to tell you that in Norway, 98 point something percent of women breastfeed. This is Catherine Garland, we're fighting shame. What? This is Catherine Wait, wait. That is, who knows what religion they are, but I just let me speak about how that happened. It didn't just happen. There was hardly any breastfeeding in Norway, and a nurse <coughs> and a couple of her friends got together about 20 or 25 years ago and said, we're going to change that, and they started to lobby. And they started to lobby that women had time to breastfeed, which was not unwaged. Women got something for it. And women were given time to do it. And it was respected by the society generally. And women began to breastfeed. Women wanted to breastfeed. It's not that women don't want to breastfeed. Women don't know how, what a labor-saving device breastfeeding is. They think, 
Uh, look, you know, this is a whole discussion because, you know, I don't think... You know why middle-class women breastfeed? It's because they can afford to. Women in the working class don't breastfeed because they can't afford to. Where's this time supposed to come from? In fact, it is a labor-saving device, although it does take some time. But it does mean that your child is likely to be healthier for the rest of his or her life. And that is not an optional extra. And I think that if women were told what the implications are for breastfeeding, that they would say, but I can't afford to, and you would have to get some money to help them to do it. And that would be a great thing, because the state should pay for breastfeeding, because among other things, it will save <coughs> hospital and doctor bills. And you can make that case. And anybody who is interested in making it, we have a book called The Milk of Human Kindness, which is the ex exploration of breastfeeding from a political point of view. Just on a very small point, just the, um, it's not just about education. Our other formative companies are very, very powerful here. Well. Like, they're putting out a lot of counter education, like support for breastfeeding, but it's very, very insidious. It's not, um, it's really a big issue. It's not just about staying near the midwife and some people going out and trying to educate women. You just, it's, it's a huge industry that's anti-breastfeeding in Ireland. It's a huge anti-breastfeeding industry in Ireland. Yes, but there was a time when Nestle was called the baby killer, yep. and Nestle couldn't avoid it, you know, couldn't deny it. It was perfectly clear that babies were dying en masse because, um, because mothers in Africa were denied breastfeeding. There's been a great struggle among African mothers. I've been there and know that among African mothers and their supporters, like the grannies and aunties and all the rest, to support them in refusing the formula. I mean, there is a class struggle going on about breastfeeding, and women have a right to turn it down, but they should make an informed decision, one that's backed by resources. They have a right to that information, they have a right to the resources to make the decision to breastfeed. That's all I'm concerned about. The information and the resources. And then we'll see who breastfeeds and who doesn't, and whether it's only the middle class. Uh, yeah, that's going to be the last question. Just and then. Point, to say that women have, the middle class women have the resources to breastfeed. In Ireland, the middle class women are expected to breastfeed, both black women are not. So that's a big, big thing that we need to change women uh, on the left and women in the movement is to start to challenge the myth that working class women don't breastfeed. And so I, I think that's definitely a problem within the whole healthcare system and society uh, more generally. And younger women, younger women don't breastfeed. The, the breastfeeding rates of younger women is, is shocking in Ireland because younger women are working class women generally, are, are working class women who have babies are generally younger and not expected to breastfeed. We have to kind of challenge that, in my opinion. Okay. Um, I will ask. I agree. <laughs> I can ask. Uh, I can get one more question, and then we wrap. If people want to more questions, if not, we leave it. Yeah. Okay. Maria, question straight to comment. I really enjoyed both your your talks. That's great. And um, I just want to say, recommend as well, Connor, for your presentation. I think we need more men to speak about care work and the labors of care work. <laughs> And for me, <coughs> to other men about Thank you very much. Thank you. Is that the end of it, or do we have room for another question? Uh, you can have one, but it's very, very short. Thank you for being so <laughs> Do you want to answer? Thank you. <laughs> OK, yeah. Uh, I want to ask Connor a question. Um, Connor, how do we... I just want to talk it was out. They put me back in, you know? <laughs> oh, God, okay. Shit. Connor, how do we uh, get care reflected in the official statistics? Um, I don't know. <laughs> 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 Can I 
answer You know, I mean, you know, I mean, you know, I mean. Sister wants to answer. Yeah. Oh, no, no, you go ahead. No, I mean, like, I don't know. So, so I'm not going to bullshit you. I mean, I, I don't know. So leave it over to someone who, 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 who could answer that question. No, I think we organize. Yeah. You know, I think that's what we have to do. They're not going, they're not going to count it. Yeah, um, exactly. Our organisation uh, organised when the UN declared the decade for women. Some of tell it much better than I can, but uh, our organisation organised many different groups uh, and organisations under a network called the International Women Count Network to get it put into the Beijing Declaration for Women that governments had to count yeah. the work the care work in national statistics. And that was one hell of an organised job that had to be done to force them to do that. I think there was the US government and the Vatican were opposing at various points, of course. (laughs) Uh, So, you know, we won that. A movement won that. And I think the story have... is told in here, by the way, it's called an, the UN Decade for Women, an offer we couldn't refuse. So I think, I think it's the same now. And the petition that Selma was talking about, which our network has in the UK and the US, and I really, really would love to organise one here, and if we could have help on yeah. the statistics and the information would be fantastic. Oh, A living yeah. wage for mothers and other carers. Yeah, to demand it, I want that 65 billion. Yeah, I, you know, it's all here, it's all here. Um, and I think some of the stuff uh, we've been looking into already, some of the facts and figures are absolutely shocking, talking to Bridget this morning about uh, the number of traveller children suicides is seven or eight times higher than the national average. The number of African children taken into care is 20 times higher than the national average. You know, the, all of the care work the, the brother spoke about uh, for in the healthcare system for older people, for exam- example, there's nothing in place. Someone has to do that. Someone is doing all of that work. I think we have to make all of that visible and demand, you know, and we would really like to consult other sectors uh, of the class, other organisations. I'm sure there are many of you here today who would be really great to work with and to consult on that so that it is, it's an organising tool and we can put it together, we can put all those sectors together. Can I say something Yes, I do want to say something before we leave each other today. Two things, in fact. The first is what has happened as caring has been downgraded and that a mother, a really good mother, is one who leaves her children behind and stack shelves in the local supermarket. And that shows that she's really a feminist. Well, thank you, I'm not a feminist, and I don't want to be that kind of feminist, and there are millions of women who don't want to be that feminist either. But it has eroded the respect and dignity and value of caring, and mothers are really more undermined than ever they have been. And that does not help anybody except those on top. We are not better if we are not mothers, whether we are mothers or not, if mothers are demeaned. And what do mothers do? Oh, all they do is make children and a lazy old day and watch television. Excuse me. You know, Tony Blair, that mass murderer, Mm -hmm. said that women who do that are workless. And that shows that he was heartless and mindless. We will not have that. We have to fight that. We have a right to survive. We have a right to care. We have a right to eat. We have a right to be part of the human race. And anyone who challenges anybody ahead to help us and cares for us then we have to go for them because that's not only the class enemy, that's the enemy of humanity. The second point is on prostitution. I'm speaking later tonight. And as an example of what has happened to the 1% or the 13% of feminists, 
who have gone up, what they are proposing about the prostitution laws is classic. It, uh, an important piece of repression has been the fact that they want to undermine and destroy the only chance that many women have of a decent wage or any wage at all that is in prostitution. In the UK, in 19, I can't remember, where, where, what, when did those two letters, 1998, 1999, I, I have the letter here. Two bills were before Parliament at the same time. One was welfare reform, that is, taking welfare away from single mothers, and one was prostitution repression and they went together and we put them together and we asked feminists to sign on against them and we could not get one who was prominent because women were going to be thrown into the street to work as hookers because they didn't have money to feed their children and when they got there there would be prostitution laws to put them in prison. Good? Delicious for those who call us workers and who are mass murderers. <laughs> so uh, I'm glad to speak tonight uh, with the sisters who are, you will tell them, with the sisters who are organizing this meeting against the feminists, and they are feminists, that's what they say they are, who want to help prostitutes by taking away their possibility of making a living. That is their assistance. And they have, none of them, acted in this way unless they have first consulted with the police and the Home Secretary. Do not believe that this is free, gratis, and for nothing. This is a career move, and it's women who are going to pay if we allow them to get this through. So this is your chance. A little autonomy can go a long way, and every worker is a respected worker, and we are with them all the time. And thank you very much for having me.